It's now recording officially. Um, okay, so we start, guys. Um, can you see my first slide? The first slide? Yes, we do. Great. So, welcome to the virtual ITF 107 role interim meeting. We are happy that you are here. Please be aware that this meeting is aligned with not well. Um, read carefully. We are not going to read it here. Our meeting materials, please uh, put your name and affiliation into the etherpad. Is the link there. Uh, okay, we have the slides as well. And the Java, Java, uh, Michael is there, Pascal, then the link in to the mailing list. Mm, sorry for not putting here. Uh, it's role at java.itf.org. And in uh, as well in the etherpad is the information how to you can create a link an account and install the uh, client so it would be nice if you can volunteer for minus taker or i will watch we will be watching the java here okay this is our agenda uh, so we are going to have first pascal Ines. the Yes. I don't see the slides anymore. How about uh, others? You don't see the slides? No, me neither. Uh, me neither. Oh. Oh, no. I'm not sharing anymore. Okay. Or something. Sorry. Let's see. Uh, oh, wait. Yes. Mm -hmm. Para share application. The wait. Um, slide. Hello. Now? Yep. Okay. And now? Yes, full screen. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Yes, I got disconnected because it's beta for I am Ubuntu. They say that it's beta sharing. So, sorry. Um, so, this is our agenda. Um, so, we have. Uh, Pascal first uh, explaining uh, the updates in Anaware Leaf, then Raul the updates in PDAO related with the Ripple status, then Pascal talking about uh, which is about the cluster that uh, is dealing with a lot of documents. Then Raul is going to uh, explain the updates in capabilities and Mopex. Then Aris is going to explain us uh, the updates in uh, NC extension. Then Raul is going to well, give us the ripple observation. Then we are going to go to a new document, the this modification use cases. That's very important to address the modification ITF document. Then Michael will give us update enrollment priority, and Pascal will introduce again the LIDNDI information new document. Some comments about the agenda? No? Okay, we continue. Okay, we so have... remind everybody that the yes. uh, timing is quite short. Uh, Ten minutes is quite short, so make your presentation concise and to the point. Yeah. So we have our milestones. We have three milestones done so far. So we have submitted to the ISG turn on 138 and the unaware leaf. And as well, we already have the notepad DAO. Mm, about the use of Ripple Info, we are with the last updates, and the version 39 should be soon ready for shipping. But uh, yeah, we are correcting some reviews. So, which are the status of our inter internet draft? So, how you see, we are going to have a lot of uh, of this today discussion, and I will say two of them are in the ISG. And there are some others that they are uh, standby. Um, from the related internet draft, we are going to have two of them today. So we have, uh, thank you very much to everyone that opened the tickets. Um, so we have uh, documents. We have opened this because until the, well, uh, finalized, I think it's fine to have it open. Ripple status code 130 is already changed to 195. So, um, then we have some for ripple observations and from the capabilities. Uh, as well, we have for well enrollment priority 
probably they are fixed now. We have to check that and then the DAO projection. Uh, we as well we have some old tickets that we keep in both systems, but the priority in the GitHub. This is just for anyone to look at that, at that they can see as well into the ITF uh, tool. Okay, so we have kind of connections for the documents. So we have um, the ripple observation uh, state with issues should be worked on. Then capability draft uh, have a lot of connection with, uh, with different uh, documents with the uh, leading data information. Um, with MOPEX, the state that is, are mutually exclusive. So therefore we have separated to the both documents. As well, they propose a capability indicator to support syslog RH. And um, the Roman priority mentioned as well the capability draft that maybe could be implemented like that. Um, the capability draft, uh, well, got disconnected with the project DAO. Um, then we have a uh, line the information related with the, this modification that modif modify the disk based object. And as well related with the use cases. And um, unaware leave, it's a light with use of Ripple Info and as well with efficient MPDO. Mm, okay. Uh, Pascal, please. <clears throat> so, yeah, uh, hello. I'm just starting the video because I'm talking, but uh, if somebody has bandwidth issues, please let me know and I will stop the video. Um, did you make me the presenter? I uh, know I will, sorry. Uh, we don't mention uh, you just have to make me tell me next and i will so we save more time like that okay so next please <laughs> so um there, there was a lot of effort between iatf uh, 106 and iatf uh, 107 on the ripper and aware draft and there are reasons for that one big reason is that uh, the unaware draft is the last draft uh, in, in order, it was the least progress draft holding cluster 310. So I will tell you later about cluster 310 and you'll see why. The other thing is there is actual demand from the field about uh, providing the unaware leaf because people sense that the, the low power devices at the edge of the network that don't participate to Ripple would spend a lot of energy if um, they would have to, to use Ripple. So uh, enabling just the uh, RFC 8505 as the interface to the Ripple router and removing Ripple from the edge device, from the low power leaf, that is actually very useful in the field. So, so there is demand for that. Last but not least, uh, 8505 is used uh, as the host to router interface in a number of, of drafts, actually. It's used, no, 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 no. Ah. It's used by Ripple, it's used with unaware leaf, it's used by Rift, it's also used in the backbone router draft to, to trigger proxy operation. So it's a, a, a useful feature, but there was no draft which really explained for any of them uh, fine grain details. So, so it's a good example for somebody who wants to implement the equivalent function in Rift, for instance. So we progressed a lot, went through uh, work group uh, last call, and now just Ines has just submitted the document to, to the um, uh, for submission to the ASG. And so next slide, please. So what went in? Well, if you if you make the diff uh, across all the versions, all the steps we made since last ITF. there are many many editorials and, and small changes. So I didn't go through any through the long list, I just uh, picked the, the most important changes. So for one, uh, we did improve quite a lot the description of how RFC8505 works. And uh, we did that to, to explain how that matches, because 8505 is the host behavior, how that matches the router behavior that we have in this in this. RFC. Um, there was also a lot of work with Ines and Michael on use of Ripple Info and all the flows, and you'll see that some of my slides after this are about that. And so we synchronized the two specification, decided the, the normative relationship between the two, and so we ended up with uh, this doc having a normative reference to uh, use of Ripple Info and placing in use of Ripple Info on the text about external routes. And uh, the uh, Ripple and Nowhere Leaf is a form of external route, it's, it's a host external route. 
Um, so we also included text about the minimum functionality that can, that needs to be supported by the rule to be able to qualify as a rule and, and be usable in this draft. Even though we, we document the router behavior, there's still, there is still dependency on, on the host behavior, in particular being a, IPv6 compliant for the way it consumes uh, a hub header as a host and the way it ignores a source route header that is actually consumed. So we also added text on 6 CIO since we use it. Um, it's just descriptive because it's, it's the behavior, the background that is needed for this draft. So we don't change RFC uh, 7400, but we, 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 we show how it plays in this story. And we also added the flag, and that's important one in the repo config to option to be able to signal that the root will do the EDAR, EDAC exchange with the repo root is CLDR. So you can actually save this packet across the network. So the, the periodic EDAR, EDAC exchange that refreshes the state at the 6 CLDR is actually um, proxied by the root, so, so you don't have two packets, the DAO and then the EDAR that goes all, all through the network. And that's again because we want to save power. Uh, so there was a house request to, to actually document the, the termination flows, so we have that. Like I said, many editorials. N next slide, please. Okay, so um, I don't know if we have time, the chairs tell me what I did here is across like the four or five next slides, I provided um, illustrations on the headers um, that have to be install, uh, inserted in case of a ripple and aware leaf. If you have time, if we have time, then, then we can spend the five minutes. If we yeah. don't have time, then please save that. That can be useful. We can have, I think, five minutes to explain. Okay. So um, the first slide is about the, 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 the storing mode over, uh, overhead, and that's for uh, any Reaper aware node. And we see that if we have a packet coming from the internet, um, typically what happens is you have to, to encapsulate IP and IP because it's the API. And since we don't actually insert, we have to encapsulate. So to be able to, be able to add the RPI to the packet, a, a packet to, coming from the internet will, will have this RPI. So it's kind of typical inside a, a Ripple network to do some encapsulation. Next slide, please. Um, and in non-storing, the, 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 we have more information to add in the outer header because we have to put the source route path. And I've indicated the case here. Of, of this node uh, 56, for which we have to, to add not only the RPI, but the source route info. Next. And it's just to be able to compare, but the typical routing stretch for in, in storing mode in, in a, uh, for a Ripple aware node would be that the packet have to go to the current parent. Since the node is, is Ripple aware, it will put an RPI in the packet. So the, the, the common parent will just forward the, the case, we'll just forward the packet down. But if the packet is coming uh, from the root, then um, the, the, the root also inserts an RPI, and that's the, the thing that you see on the bottom right. So this is very typical. I don't want to spend time on that. But this is the traditional RPI uh, being in the packet. Next. Okay, and in non-storing mode, as you know, we have to go all the way to the common parent. So even if the source is Ripple aware and the destination is Ripple aware, um, so the source sends the packet with the RPI as usual, but the packet will follow the default route all the way to the root because there is no better route inside the network. So it will go above uh, common parent 22 all the way to the root. The root will, will tunnel the packet, so it will have to encapsulate the packet, even if it's coming from inside the Ripple domain. And you see the difference. Now we have this double encapsulation and double RPI. I hope it's clear. Then again, there is nothing new to the rule. It's just the way Ripple works. But just to be clear, that that's the situation we have today. Mm -hmm. Next. And uh, yes, there is this alternate possibility where <clears throat> the, the source, which is a run, instead of placing the RPI straight in the packet, uses an encapsulation to the root. And you may do that. That doesn't make the path longer. The difference is that the root can uh, remove the outer header, so it removes the RPI. 
So at the root, we get the packet, which is just source 51, destination 52, and stuff, which is the content of the packet, but the RPI is gone, which means that the, the packet on the way up is bigger, but the packet on the way down is smaller, basically. So using the format on the left is what the, the run can do. If it wants to send a packet to the internet and it wants to make sure that the, the RPI will not fly, uh, there, now that we use 23, um, it's, it's not needed because normally the internet will ignore the RPI. Next. Okay, and there, there goes the new discussion and these are the slides which are new and I hope, uh, I mean, uh, Ines, check with me please, but I hope I was correct. So yeah. we again we start from a packet which is uh, generated by a rule which is uh, 51. So 51 is not aware of ripple, so by definition there is no RPI. So it just sends this packet 51 to whatever destination. It doesn't right matter really. And um, so the, the first uh, CSLR, the first operator 41, will have to encapsulate this packet to be able to insert uh, an RPI. And as it goes, the packet always. Uh, goes to the root. Mm -hmm. So it will encapsulate source 41, destination root, RPI, and then you get your pack. Yeah. Uh, if the, uh, when the packet reaches the, the root, then the root will decapsulate and that's the thing that you see on the top right. Source 51, destination internet stuff. So if the packet goes to the internet, fine, that's exactly what you expect on the internet, there's no RPI. And if, uh, on the other hand, the packet is for a destination, which is like 56 on the bottom right, then the root will have to encapsulate. So we're in, uh, in the, I gave just the illustration in case of storing mode, um, that will be the source root destination, not 56, because it's a run, and uh, an RPI, and then the, the, the encapsulated packet. Okay, so I just gave one example of going down in the case of a, of a run, and that's what you would get. Next slide, please. Okay. So now, if the destination is a rule, so the way up is exactly as we said, I'm not doing it again. I'm just focusing on the, on the rightmost piece now. And I have two cases of packet, and, and the packet can be, for instance, coming from the internet. So that's the, the thing you see on the top. So you get a source internet destination 56 and whatever content. And you see that the, the route will encapsulate um, destination, the 6LR that serves the node 56, because 56 is a rule. So remember, we are using non storage mode signaling uh, for XLR routes, meaning that um, the, the root knows the parent of 56, and that's 46. So the root will turn on to 46 to add the RPI. That's true if the packet comes from the internet. That's true if the packet comes from the rule. And as we saw, it's also true if the packet com comes from the rule on the bottom left, because it would have been encapsulated by 41 to the root, and the root would have decapsulated it. So in any case, if it's coming from a rule, from the internet, or from the root, we end up with the plain packet that has to be encapsulated with an RPI to the parrot, to 46. Okay, next. Um, so in story mode, it doesn't make any difference because the route to the route to 56 is not known to the network. So following the default route to the command parent gives you all the way to the route anyway. Um, so whether the source is a RAN or the source is a rule, the packet will always reach the route. If the source is a rule, uh, then we saw that the, the parent 41 would have encapsulated to the route anyway. But if the source is a run, like for instance illustrated on the left, well, it's not even what's illustrated. We don't, we really don't, doesn't, don't care. The, the packet will reach the root anyway. So what the root gets is a packet with possibly an RPI if it was coming from a run, but also or otherwise it's a plain packet to Mr. 56. Um, so so if, if the root is the one injecting the packet, then uh, it may avoid encapsulation, and that's, I guess, illustrated here. In this case, it may decide to use um, a source route header to the parent, as opposed to using an encapsulation to the parent, if it is the source of the packet. If the source of the packet is something else, then that cannot happen. But I guess what I really wanted to illustrate with this slide is the root is the source, it has this alternate capability, this alternate possibility, 
instead of encapsulating to 46, to just say next up 46 and in the routing header of uh, 56. And then what's going to happen is 46 will receive the packet, see that there is a routing header, swap the destination IP and the routing header, consume the routing header, forward the packet to 56. And that's the case where 56 will have to ignore a consumed route. Next slide. Um, so this is the more normal, so I'm just surprised that this slide comes after the other because it should have been before. So I just swapped them somehow. Uh, so this is the, the most normal case for a non-storing mode to a rule. Um, so the, the, the packet is, uh, whether it's coming from the internet or coming from the root in most cases, or, or even from the, from the network, uh, anyway, reaches the root. Anyway, the root decapsulates it if it was encapsulated from the inside or just it's a plain packet from the internet. And the root will have to encapsulate uh, the packet to, to, the, to the parent. And since we are in non-storing, then there will be all the intermediate hops. I, I give you uh, one format, which is uh, the black source, source root destination 46. That it doesn't really matter if the inner packet is the one from the root, from the internet, or from, from, from 51, which was a rule in this case. You see that at the end of the day, the, the root has this packet, which is the, those three elements, and it's all encapsulated. And the way it arrives, so what you see illustrated with this big ladder is what 46 sees. So what 46 sees is a packet where 35 has done the swap. So 35 is uh, the, the last consu and consumed uh, entry in the routing header. 46 is the destination. So 46 gets a packet for which the external header is fully consumed. The external routing header is fully consumed. It is the destination. So it will decapsulate. And the inner packet, which is the original packet, regardless of its destination, will, will reach 56. So in this case, you see that 56 gets a clean packet without an RP. The only case where there would be an RPI is uh, the case of a source inside the network, which is a RAN. Otherwise, the packet is clean. So if the source is a RAN, so there's an RPI, and that's why we have to mention that uh, uh, a rule must ignore an, an RPI because it's a RPI operator and it's a host, so it has to ignore that. Next. Okay. And that's it then. Any question? I know that was quick, but I just wanted you to have the slides as a reference if you always wonder about uh, what is written in uh, user Ripple info and uh, how that translates. I hope that these illustrations help you. Yeah, thank you very much. They do indeed. Yeah, thank you so much. I've uh, read uh, the yeah, draft. Actually, and I, it, having this drawing is very good. Hello. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, it, it would actually be very nice to have this uh, slides in the role working group uh, repository alongside the draft, you know, so uh, it, it, it provides a good place for reference. You mean save that on GitHub, you mean, when you talk about... Yeah, 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 in the GitHub. Okay. Yeah, it in the, good idea. In the GitHub. Good idea, I can GitHub, I just have to remember. Yeah. Thank you. Do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, good idea. Okay, uh, so I can begin, I can start. Yes, please. Thank you, Raoul. Okay, okay, so Michael, this... did you want to ask a question? No, I was going to say the same thing Raoul did. Okay, okay all right. Great. So uh, this is going to be a quick update about the DCO status. So the document, the draft has been waiting for a particular value. Uh, the RPL status value, uh, we finally have it. Again, thanks to the unaware leaves draft, we I think are in a final position to conclude this uh, conclude this draft. Uh, can next next slide please? So so this is the final value that we uh, arrived at 195. The reason being this value eventually is the same value which six slow as well as RPL will be making use of. So it like, makes an implementation slightly easier, uh, such that even if a RPL unaware leave or RPL aware node moves from one parent to another, 
the mood status would be same for both the cases. So it actually simplifies uh, not only the implementation, but I'm hoping that uh, in the future, this would aid uh, debugging as well. Uh, yeah, so uh, the, this is the only update that the draft has. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, the the slide before the slide before. Yes. Um, this one. Okay. So yeah, this one. So uh, why nine? Why one ninety five? Uh, that is the slide that I'm looking for with the title. Why one ninety five? Uh, just just send these ones. Next Only. one. Yeah. After the, this one. There is a slide in between. Yeah, this one. Mm -hmm. This one, 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 yeah. <laughs> latency, Why latency. latency. <laughs> ah, there is latency, yeah. yeah. A lie. <laughs> okay, uh, so this uh, this gives us the rationale about what is this value. So if you see this, this value is a combination of values. So we have RFC 8505, which says that uh, status of mood, uh, uh, what happens, uh, what, what is the status that should be given when the node, uh, the 6, uh, 6LR node moves from one. Uh, one parent to another, which is uh, which is the same value which RPL will also be making use of for RPL parent to, uh, RPL node movement across parents. Uh, the E and A bit has been newly defined, and this definition has been provided by another loop. So uh, uh, that is that is what uh, uh, the slides talks about. That's that's pretty much it. You know, the whole point about waiting for this value was to make sure that you know this we, we, we are in synchronization we are we are synchronous with uh, unaware leaves as well as 8505 uh, changes that's about it from from me for this uh, I, I hope I can make use of my time for the next uh, next presentation thank you very much Raul questions thank you, thank you. okay now Pascal if you don't have questions. Okay, Pascal. Hello. Yes, yes, I'm coming. Ah, okay. um, I was just adding the slides to the repo so to make sure I, I did not forget. So, so uh, I did ah, that okay. when I was listening to Howard. So, yes, um, I, I wanted to just tell you about this cluster 310 because maybe some people are not too used to the way the uh, RFC editor operates. And so, uh, as you know, there are normative dependencies. Some drafts have a normative dependency on an RFC or on a different draft. And this creates a graph. And the RFC editor tends to um, group the, the drafts based on those, uh, on those graphs uh, into clusters. So basically, interdependent drafts are grouped into a cluster. And there is usually like one draft or two drafts, which kind of are not yet published, and they are blocking every other draft that has a, a normative dependency on them. Uh, and the cluster is kind of locked until the, the, the dependent draft uh, are finished. So the documents we are working on at Roll and at six low and at six dish, they kind of uh, have this sort of interdependency and the cluster that uh, holds them is, is 310, cluster 310. So I gave you the link here, RFC editor cluster 310. Can you please uh, move on? Okay, so uh, there are, in, in the cluster, there are RFCs which are already published, and those three uh, appear in 310 as published. So, so the, the, some, some progress can be done inside the cluster, some drafts can be published, and some others can be waiting. But there are other cases. Next slide, please. And what we are really interested in is, uh, for, I just give one example of a draft in, inside this cluster, and this uh, the efficient NPDAO. And we see that the efficient NPDAO is not published as an RFC. And why? Because it's ready. Well, because it has this uh, misref that you see on the right, missing normative reference, that's what it means. And the 1J one G, one G means that uh, it's just one hop, meaning that the, the, the graph is not deep, it's just, there, we are waiting for draft ITF raw and aware leaf to be uh, published and uh, as an RFC, and then immediately, and usually with almost consecutive numbers, uh, the raw and if efficient NPDAO would be published. Now, you see that the draft and aware leaf is marked as not received, and that's because the RFC editor um, 
only sees the RFC once it has passed the RFC last the ITF last call and the ISG reviews. Uh, so we just uh, are making the the publication request now, and that's why uh, the RFC editor marks it marks it as not received. Next. Um, there are also other cases, like if you look at the use of repair info. So I made the slides like two two weeks ago, but I guess this listing has not changed. Um, the marking is ISG, and that really means that the draft has been uh, is now held by the ISG. In this case, because we took it off the queue to do some addition, align with an aware, etc., and put it back, so it's marked as ISG. Uh, other drafts like uh, the uh, APND are marked as uh, ESG because the, the, the authors had to make some addition and so the, the ISG has to confirm that these additions are correct before giving back to the RFC editor. So uh, on, on the cluster pages from the RFC editor, you'll find the explanation for all those terms like MISREF or ISG. But that's basically what it means. Next. Okay, and you see that some draft uh, may be, uh, may have a, a high number of dependencies. And you even see uh, uh, an R2G there because uh, the architecture needs an enhanced beacon and an enhanced beacon, uh, I don't remember which one. So, so, so that's two degrees now of depth in the graph. But when you look at all of them, uh, they are, most of them are, are in the RFC editor queue. The only one the only ones which uh, were not there are uh, an aware leaf and MSF. And we we were, to, to, well, MSF was uh, ahead of an aware leaf, so is ahead of an aware leaf. It's mostly past the ASG reviews now. And so um, that's why an aware leaf was really the draft on which we had to pay particular attention. Because you see, it's, it's holding many, many drafts. Go ahead, please. So in, in this uh, cluster, actually, there are only three drafts which were marked as not received when uh, I made these slides. Um, so I, I gave the status. At the time I made the slides, there was only one yes missing and one discussed to solve. I've not seen that it's solved for MSF, but it's pretty much there. And um, the core stateless was on the ASG telechat agenda for uh, four days ago. I have not seen the result, but I'm pretty. I'm, I'm really hopeful that uh, core stateless is uh, is now done. I just have to check uh, the result of the telechat when it's published. So you see that unaware leaf is really the cornerstone that was holding three term. Next, I think we are okay. So uh, just on time. Yeah. Okay, so that gives yeah. you. The, the latest documents that we've been working on and discussing. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. So, how does how does uh, how is uh, core stateless draft uh, dependent upon another leaf? So, uh, in, in your previous slide, I'm just curious to understand this. The, the um, sixty-ish architecture and the sixty-ish minimal security drafts. Basically, minimal security needs needs uh, core, and architecture means minimal needs minimal security. So there is this relationship. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Pascal. Further questions? Okay, thank you very much, uh, Raúl. Please go ahead. So I'm I'm going to talk about uh, uh, capabilities and mopex. So finally, we had uh, separated these two topics. Into, into two different drafts. Uh, capabilities draft had a major update. Uh, we have uh, major, major new sections. One of them, a primary section, was the recommendations for adding new capabilities. So what should any, anyone who is trying to add a new capability, what should uh, they take care of? Uh, you know, there are several bits, how each of those bits have to be handled. That is what has been explained in that section. Uh, new capability in instances have been added. So. Uh, this this draft not only gives us the syntax about the capabilities, but adds specific instances now, which could be used for six law RH. Having said that, uh, the capability instances are not specifically for six uh, for six law RH. It is specific to six law RH, but for projected DAO, it can be made use of for any other any other 
any other purpose as well and i'll get to that in subsequent slides security consideration i think it still needs more work uh, uh, we have added uh, ravi as co-author for most uh, uh, capability instances six law rh and projected tau uh, are added by him and uh, I, I think those are th th those are that is really a good work we have fixed uh, some of the references uh, can we go to the next slide so uh, the mopex there is no new addition here uh, there is no no changes uh, having said that there is one primary what well, there is one point that i would like to discuss with the working group uh, uh, which which came up later in uh, uh, which came up in a discussion last week uh, anyways uh, that 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 problem statement has been added to the observations draft and we are wondering whether that problem statement can be taken care of in the mopex draft uh, but we will come to that point later this is a minimal document with a very clear motivation and proposition. We hope to take it very fast uh, to the next level. Uh, there has been no design changes or any, any any major updates to this document. And next slide, please. So, this is this is one of the one of the thing that uh, that that was that was that was uh, realized uh, uh, re we, that we realized that anytime we are adding a new option we have this backward compatibility issues so this is this is not only true for enrollment priority lighting DAOs and, and its extension so what happens is a node which supports the new option sends an option the downstream peers or the upstream peers who doesn't understand that option are going to strip that option so what happens so ideally there should be some way of telling the upstream or downstream node if you don't support it at least copy it forward. Uh, so we are hoping that we can handle this in the MOPEX, essentially telling that whenever you define a new option, if the most significant bit of that option type value, uh, option type is set, it would mean that the intermediate node has to copy forward. Of course, this means that all the nodes have to be at least supporting this draft, but once this draft is supported by the nodes, then it would result much lesser issues with backward compatibility problems uh, is what our is what we are thinking does it make sense it's not going to incur any any new overhead it's it, it's just about uh, you know changing uh, the interpretation of the option type value based on the most significant effect. how would you agree that was uh, the sort of reason why we wanted at some point to to say okay we we are talking about ripple v2 because we we, we will place actually requirements on any ripple v2 node and being right. able to understand this particular specification is certainly a, a, a cornerstone of what it means to be a v ripple v2 node so we'll know that uh, th th those options will be processed as expected so yes it's, it's completely important the other thing that we, we usually signal is what you do if you see an option that you don't understand. Um, do you ignore the full package uh, or do you ignore the option? Uh, mm -hmm. For instance, if I get a DIO with a certain option and this is critical to joining that bag, not understanding the option, you should not process the DIO. So the only way to signal that is to have another bit, exactly like mm -hmm. bit here, but which mm -hmm. says, Ignore the DIO or process the DIO, ignoring the option. Okay, yeah, I got the point. So, so this this particular point we have taken care of individually for capability options. But what you're saying is it, this should be generalized. It is applicable for any new option or any. Yeah, that that. Okay. Uh, but one thing is we don't have any option flags as such uh, specifically for every option. So all we have is option type and the length and the option data so the only place where we can make change uh, we can depend upon this uh, the, these kind of bets in case of options is the type value uh, so it would reduce the entropy it, we, uh, it, it might not necessarily reduce because yeah okay but i got this point uh, uh, okay let's uh, let's uh, take this up on the mailing list as well Thank you. Thank you, Pascal. Uh, next slide, please. So capabilities of update, one of the primary update that we wanted to do before was compare it with uh, existing MOP. 
configuration option and routing metrics and constraint. I can see that a lot of people are getting confused between how is it different from these three things. So there is an explicit section added on what you should do, what you should consider for uh, uh, defining a new thing as a capability rather than anything else which is mentioned here. Uh, there are some guidelines that have been defined for new capabilities, how to set the global uh, flag, info flag, join as leaf flags, uh, how should the node handle the capability, capability if it does not support it before or after joining the instance. What happens if the node joins uh, the instance and later it finds out a capability which says that I'm mandatory to support and it has already joined the instance. So things like this, the corner cases have been handled. Uh, and again, when to use and when not to use capabilities, of course, uh, there is a different separate section on that. Next slide, please. Uh, global and local capabilities. So this is one thing that was discussed on uh, the mailing list before. We need to have a, 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 a bit which says that the root has set this capability and no one should uh, change it. Uh, this way, the root will be able to say that I'm supporting so and so capability without any of the intermediate node touching it. So there is a flag for that now. Uh, it's 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 a it's a separate flag. If you can see that the G flag is there. Uh, yeah, that's that's uh, that's pretty much it. All these intermediate six LRs are supposed to copy these gaps in their DIOs as well as the other messages uh, uh, as well. Next slide, please. So there are two new capabilities, two types of capabilities basically uh, that are added. So, so there are two types of capabilities. One are uh, a node says that I support a certain feature. And the other type of capability is that I support a feature with so and so parameters or so and so capabilities. So, uh, there is an additional information. So for 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 any capability which supports an additional information, we already have a definition for that wherein a capability can have additional capability information, but for all the capabilities who require, who are just a support or does not support, a flag-like indicator, we are trying to put all those together in, in, in a single option, in a single type. What it allows us to do is, it allows us to reduce the control overhead, because if, if, if you keep having a separate option, capability type for each of these indicators, uh, then it would uh, unnecessarily increase the control over it for uh, these, these messages carrying these capabilities. So we're calling this capability indicators group. Uh, again, the name, I, I've taken this name from the Wi-Fi capability uh, specification. They also call it the same thing. Uh, and uh, I, I think using anything else like capability flags would have, uh, the, the, there is a big scope for mis uh, misinterpretation there. So uh, capability indicators group. Uh, is, is, is the term that we are trying to use here. Question, Horm? Yes, yes, Tom. Um, I see you have chosen to have 24 bits, but you still have the length indicator, which is free in this case. Right. Do yes. you expect to be able to expand that in the future? And, yes. And then so, how so, will the 24 so, bits map on to 32 or 48? Yeah, so the idea is, in fact, in fact, Till the time we, we are hoping that initially we can set this length to one as well so the value the bit so what we'll say is that the bit the second most bit of the of 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 this value would represent uh, so, so we are hoping that we should be able to reuse one two three or any value in the future Right now, the draft mandates it. To, I mean, the, the right now the draft says that it is length equal to three. But uh, for example, the example t, the six lower edge flag, which is specified here t, it shows that the leftmost, uh, the rightmost uh, bit is set. I don't know how to put it. Uh, how, how can I phrase it properly? Uh, what I want to set is, uh, set is the location of the bit in that area dict dictates where it is, and we can change the length to any value, not only three, in the future. OK, good. Thank you. Should we be numbering these bits from left to right? So the T bit should really uh, go on the left so that we can add bytes to the right-hand side? Or did you intend the T bit to always float to the right in this case, the zeroth bit? I actually intended it to the right, but I think maybe keeping it on the left. 
might also be okay. Uh, so what I was saying is that 0x01 will be, will, will, will be the T bit. Uh, if you send le set length equal to one and 0x01 is the only value, is the value, then it means that the T bit is set, which is the rightmost bit. We can as well make use of the left mode, left leftmost bit, and that should be all right as well. I guess uh, maybe that might be more easier to read as I well as uh, either way. We have a uh, some careful IANA text to explain where the open bits are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think I think it, people's brain might be simpler if we simply call these bytes and we and we say the first byte of the capability the second byte of the capabilities flag and we make it clear mm -hmm. that we can add bytes to the i guess end mm -hmm. more okay. bits. Yeah. yeah that that that, that also sounds uh, so is there any other is there any other draft or rfc which has similar thing and i can just refer what they've done i don't know but we could ask iana okay. all right thank you Next, please. Okay, so this is another capability that has been added. So this is a different capability. We want to, we, the node should be able to set how much of rerouting resource capability it has. How, what is the total capacity it has? Again, the capability length here is, is, uh, is flexible. So if at some point of time, if it goes beyond 256, it, it, they, they can simply use a uh, capability length of two and have 65536 as the maximum value for routing resource capability. This capability would specifically be useful for uh, projection DAO is what we are thinking. Uh, we are wondering if we should do something similar for neighbor cache as well. Uh, and if we want to do it for neighbor cache as well, shall we keep it in the same, uh, same capability or have a separate one? I think routing routes, uh, routing resources more 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 required by PDAO, but uh, maybe the neighbor cache might also have an implication on 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 the route uh, segment selection uh, for for projection projected down. So uh, that uh, would be a question. We can take this uh, on mailing list if uh, wanted. Next, please. Oh, yeah, that's all. Uh, that was all. Thank you very much, Raul. Thank you. And there are further questions for Raul? OK, thank you for the questions. And uh, Aris? Hello, everyone. Yeah, yeah sure. So uh, next slide. I'm going to talk about the updates in the NSA uh, extension uh, draft. Um, it's been some time. Uh, in the meantime, uh, about uh, four versions have uh, have passed. We we have uh, addressed a, a lot of feedback from Dominique, Raúl, Fabrice, Pascal, and Diego. Uh, thank you all so very much. Um, so, as, as part of addressing of addressing these, uh, this feedback. We did a lot of uh, editorial work. We fixed typos. We rephrased some sentences, and we defined some parts that weren't clearly defined. And one of the things we also did was reorder the structure of the paper. So uh, initially, we were uh, describing the objective function that is contained in this work. And afterwards, we gave some variations on how the objective function worked. And now we reversed it, so we give more examples uh, up front, and then we go into the details of the specification. Uh, next slide, please. OK, so uh, one, the first of the changes uh, is regarding the objective function described in this draft. So we describe uh, an objective function based on the common ancestor in order to do multipath uh, replication and elimination. And uh, initially, we had defined three objective functions. Uh, for three different variations uh, of this, let's say, main idea. And we changed it now. There's just one objective function. It uses the same uh, OCP. And it just supports uh, multiple policies. And I will explain uh, that in a bit more detail. Um, we also explained how uh, these policies, the three policies that we uh, describe, 
uh, how they um, are ordered in terms of how uh, restrictive they are. So we start from the most restrictive one going to the most relaxed one. And we also explain that there's a trade-off in terms of energy consumption and reliability. The, the strictest one uh, uh, consumes less energy but provides lower reliability and the more relaxed one consumes more energy but is less reliable. Uh, the, one of the changes we also did uh, is regarding this change from multiple uh, objective functions to just one. So these objective functions are local to each uh, node. So the only information they, the node, the decision is made at the node based on information received from other nodes. But the decision at the end of the day uh, only regards this node. So it decides how to, where to replicate the packet. So there's no need for multiple uh, objective functions. Uh, each node can uh, make the decision in their own way. Multiple nodes can use different policies if they want to. Uh, of course, an administrator can make a change and force them all to use the same thing, but there is no reason to restrict this in the draft itself. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we also provided uh, more details about the information that is required for this objective function to work. So we extend the DIO control message and uh, we put some extra information in the uh, DAG metric container in, in, in the part of the node state uh, attributes object. So we define a new TLV, which is inserted there. And uh, before it was a bit low on details, we have now specified exactly how the uh, addresses that are carved inside uh, are uh, represented, uh, how they're stored in the field, how, how you can derive how many addresses are present, and uh, what their order signifies. So in this case, it uh, signifies a uh, decreasing order of preference. Finally, we say that uh, the implementer can choose how many addresses they will store, depending on the requirements and the restrictions that they have in their network. Next slide, please. Uh, one relatively late uh, change after a discussion with uh, Dominic, uh, thank you for that by the way, um, was that uh, we identified, there's, uh, we initially described the, this information in the NSA object as a constraint. Uh, we use this information in order to restrict uh, which nodes can be used for uh, replication. Uh, however, uh, Dominic pointed out that uh, if you have a constraint in a DIO packet, you also need to have a corresponding metric. So because there isn't, it does make sense to also have a metric, we changed the definition from a constraint to a metric. And uh, we also uh, set the flags for this metric to be carried in a recorded mode. And uh, with the partial flag enabled because uh, this is information sent from a parent to its children. It doesn't go further away. So it, it's always partial information. You don't get the information all the way from the root of the dodag. Uh, finally, we also uh, highlight, we, we try to clarify that this metric is not actually used to modify the rank of a, of a, of a parent, of what rank a node would get through a specific parent. So it on, it's only used to filter out potential parents, nothing else. So it, it basically operates in a way as a constraint, but it's carried as a metric. Next slide, please. Uh, we also described finally some uh, considerations regarding the security uh, aspects of this draft. So basically the main addition is that we carry uh, inside the DIO the addresses of our nodes neighbors. Uh, so a node can uh, potentially have a small privacy issue, a small network discovery issue. So a, a malicious node uh, can uh, see one hop beyond its immediate neighborhood, which it, it, it is an issue, but for me, it's not like a super bad issue, but we did highlight this in the draft. Um, and secondly, a potential problem with rerouting. So a uh, malicious uh, DIO center can uh, modify what the parent set it reports, and that way it can uh, trick other nodes into routing through itself and uh, uh, taking over the, the routing. However, uh, this is already possible by just reporting a fake rank. So this is not 
really a, a, a problem. At least it's it's no more problem than it already is in these terms. Uh, next slide. And uh, this is basically it. We, we have tried to address every issue that was raised. Some issues require discussion. We did it in the mailing list. Uh, as far as uh, we are concerned, there's no outstanding issue anymore. And uh, we'd like to find out where we can go from here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Some questions? Yeah, I have one point. Um, at last meeting, we discussed whether we wanted to compress those addresses yes. because we know, uh, you know this is going to carry IPv6 addresses. So uh, I think both myself and Pascal, we said, uh, let's uh, ship this uh, draft first and then uh, see how we do the compression. We just need to make sure that we have a, a way forward and that we have a path uh, by which we know we are going to be able to compress addresses. So I just wanted to make sure um, if we need any any flag, any hook, anything that says this is the uncompressed form and the compressed form will be slightly different. So just make sure we we have a vision for the forward with compression. Any so, suggestions? So, uh, yeah. So uh, actually, uh, I, I don't know if you remember, but uh, initially we did implement compression right in our draft. So right. we took uh, the example provided by Sixlora, uh, the the source routing header, if I remember correctly, that's the name of the thing. Uh, Michael uh, proposed that, and we right. implemented that for the set of parent addresses, and that worked. We actually have code of that. But uh, after discussion with uh, Pascal, uh, he, he said that uh, an idea would be to have a separate draft that just handles uh, compression for all control packets. So a more general approach instead of uh, doing a, 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 like a, a special solution for every field. And that might be much more efficient as well. So we took that out. Uh, I, I think that for, as far as we are concerned, uh, the six lora use of compression worked reasonably well. Uh, so we, we can use that in a, in a compression draft as a technique, but uh, we took it out because of these concerns. Right. So I, I still stand, stand by this decision that we have a homogeneous way of compressing IPv6 addresses within uh, Ripple control messages. So that that's clear. But my question is, uh, do we need anything in the format of this metric uh, or anything, any thing so that needs to be in this draft so that we can tell apart which ones are compressed, which ones are not compressed? So I, I would assume that uh, the fact that you can deduce both uh, which are the addresses in the field and how many there are just from the size is enough. This is a very homogeneous uh, format, right? You have the, your type, your length, and just a multiple of 16 bytes, one for, uh, for each IPv6 address. Now, when you do six LoRa compression, typically you you use the same compression level for each IP address in a set of IP addresses. So if you, let's say, compress each 16-byte address to 8 bytes, then all of them in a set will have the same compression level. If you want different compression levels, because uh, say one is the root, for example, and the others are not, so the root can be compressed further than the others, then you need to create two sets of, let's say, compression sets. But uh, I, I don't see why this would affect the form, uh, the uncompressed format in any way. You still maintain the same order, so I, I guess this is completely up to the compressor to solve. Okay. I, 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 I don't know if uh, we should provide something else. I would assume that this extension would be agnostic to compression in that sense. Right. Um, so we said we could use uh, capabilities to tell which nodes are able to understand the compressed form. Uh, and then the question is uh, to be able to tell which messages use the compressed form, which do not. So you're saying based on size, that would be the way to tell? Uh, no. So, okay, that's the thing. Uh, if you want to be able to compress, so my thinking for this was that you either do compression or you don't. And if you do compression, then the compressor does need to figure out the format of uh, 
of signifying which parts of the control packet it has compressed or not. And that would go directly into the work of the compressor. It wouldn't have anything to do with the uncompressed format. Uh, if you would like to do a piecemeal part, so some parts of the control packet are compressed, some others are not compressed, and uh, a node that supports compression needs to figure out at runtime which parts are which, then maybe we should add a, a field maybe indicating compressed or not, something like that. But, um, I don't know about. Well, any opinion on this? Uh, for, uh, so for, I have an opinion about the compression part. So uh, I thought uh, what we discussed previously was that we should have a generalized compression, which would work across not only this uh, set of addresses, but uh, other set of addresses as well. For example, uh, multiple targets in the DAO message. I don't know whether uh, the same should be used or uh, whether it cannot be used. Uh, regardless, I do, it would be really uh, this. These addresses are sent as part of DIO message, and the DIO message is a multicast message. We do we know that we it, we cannot afford to you know bloat it any further. So would be really nice to have uh, in my opinion again i know we have already discussed this on uh, on the mailing list and we have already decided not to do compression but it is my personal opinion that you know compression is a must uh, for this because it, it 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 without it it might not be feasible in my opinion to you know so if, even if you have two addresses it is like 32 bytes and it's it's too much for the message is what i'm trying to say it, it will it will bring down the whole utility of this proposal. I agree. In our implementation, we use the compression, right? So exactly. that's why yeah, I, think, I remember. I think we that. all agree we eventually want compression. My my question is, uh, if we ship this this way, uh, and then uh, are we sh are we not you know sh shooting ourselves in the foot and, and making it impossible to have compression later on? So if if Anybody has a clear vision on how this is going um, to work? I did some work on this um, in the early days of of the before 6550 was shipped. There was a, an appeal to rip out all the options. In fact, to rip out all the TLV processing and basically have a static uh, header um, that would contain all the important information, which we'd never extend. Right. Um, and I thought that was dumb. Um, and so I wrote about uh, 20 lines of C code that implemented generalized header compression. This is uh, Carson's document from that never really progressed, or maybe it did finally. Um, and that I showed that basically with this fairly stupid compressor, um, like 20 lines long, um, I was able to take an 80 byte uh, DIO message and make it about 37 bytes. And the proposal was for like 32 bytes or something like that was the header. Um, and I thought that kind of nailed the 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 application specific compression in the in the, in the foot, uh, but we never went ahead with any kind of uh, generalized header compression. That's what I really think we should do because that would compress any IPv6 address in any option wherever we put it um, fairly fairly easy uh, well. This didn't use a dictionary. This was stateless, um, but we could do better. I mean, there's ways of doing better, um, and GHC lets us do better incrementally like we can build it's up to the compressor to decide how smart he's going to be so that's what i would suggest we do um and that we would essentially create a um a ripple level header which says the rest of this stuff is compressed and that itself would have to be negotiated as a as a capability we would know if all the nodes support it, then we can use it in, in multicast messages. And if it's only some children that support it, then we can only use it in unicast messages. I agree. I think uh, this also gives rise to opportunities for further compression. For example, you have the, maybe you have a target option as well. What if you have the same IPv6 address in our extension and the target, for example, then you can eliminate it from both places uh, if you have like a global compressor. If you just have specific compressors for each small part, then you can't take advantage of things like this. So, yeah. 
There are, there are two angles. I, I know I'm the one who talked to you, Remusen, about we need a generic because I, I really remember how Michael explaining us the benefits of JFC, etc. There are two other angles um, that, that we need to keep in mind. So JFC may not be enabled on every node and, and that, that would, what, preclude those nodes from participating to repo? So if we really think JFC's direction, maybe it should be one of those things that must be present in every node in V2. So, so that's Ripple V2. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Um, about the compression itself, if you look at um, uh, projection, um, I'm not using the full addresses. We had that discussion long time ago as well. And since in the meantime, uh, we made 8138, so we have a a compression for ripple data packet for, for the source routing header, for instance. Uh, so for the projection in particular, when it uses source routing, it made sense to use the exact same compression. It's a very simple compression, right? It mostly lies the zeros. Um, and so basically says, what is the significant part, significant part and what is inherited from a reference? Okay. So if you have a reference which has like 14 bytes, which are always the same, then you just have to write two bytes per address in, in the compressed form. Exactly, that's what we implemented. Yes, so that's that's the uh, that should be the reference, the, the default model everywhere, um, until we we have GHC or something on top. But for I think that's the the standard way for repo for now. Uh, the other thing being that uh, with the draft I'm going to discuss later, we don't have to place every option every time. So we'll be able to to just say, oh, that's the option like I presented so many DIOs ago. Um, and so by having not to, to reproduce every option every time, we also have some kind of compression. If you want. What's important is you don't necessarily have to place all the options in all the DIOs. So if you, if you don't have enough room in one DIO, you may have to put send two DIOs in a row. And that's, that, that has to be very, very well con considered when you, you have options that are mandatory or something. Because imagine that a guy gets a, did one DIO and not the other. Uh, the mandatory options are, are in the DIO that gets lost. So, so that's something to consider in the capability and, and the MOPEX draft, actually. So we have to remember this sort of thing. But, so all, all this must work together correctly. Yes, the, the default by for now is to, to do as you said, and as we do also in our projection, right? So the simple one, which does not require any support like GHC. And I, uh, I'm really open to discussing whether GHC becomes a standard feature in Ripple. But then again, mm -hmm. you need an RFC, right? Okay, sounds good. So we have uh, many. Uh, options that need uh, address compression, so we'll have a, a wide uh, look at that and use a generic approach, but not craft any individual stuff. And what I hear is that is the standard way we do it now, which is 8138, which is very, very simple. You just put significant bytes and all the common bytes are elided. Right. And okay. And so we're saying that we don't need a, an extra bit of flag specific, specifically in the NSA extension because we are going to have a, a generic mechanism that works above that level. I think so. Okay. Sounds good. So next step. So I guess regarding your question, working group last call, yes, I think we're going to uh, issue that on the mailing list. Okay, great. I haven't heard any objections, so sounds good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Um, Raul, want to give uh, us the slide? Yeah. Can you so, see the slide? Yeah. yeah it's article observations again, so we have an update. Uh, uh, next, next, please. Uh, so we, we had the discussion about adding a section about trickle time address and then it's handling and it's there now. Uh, again, the backward compatibility issue that I mentioned before uh, is mentioned as a problem statement in this draft. Uh, uh, 
it's uh, the, the the same problem that I mentioned. If we add a new option, how do we ensure the backward compatibility? It's the same uh, thing that is mentioned here. Next slide, please. So uh, one thing, one of the major. So we have kept discussing about DAWAC so many times before, and we finally decided to do something about it. Uh, we have a new draft uh, which takes uh, which, which which sort of uh, tries to handle the problem statements towards this uh, th this section uh, so just to briefly tell what the working group it is about i, I know we have already discussed this a, a lot of times before uh, dawac is, uh, is 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 a local signaling in case of storing mode of operation target the primary problem statement is that the tiger is not aware of the end to end path establishment so whether to start an application uh, whether to start an application traffic, it's that the target needs to know when should it do it. If not knowing it, in case of multiple hops, if if if, if the node is five hops deep, then it really has a major implications on the overall overall uh, 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 overall packet delivery rate and you know the control over it that is induced. Another problem, I think we don't need to go here, but the, the six inter, the, if, if an intermediate six LR for some reason in, in, induces a negative DAO status, how should it be handled? One of the point was uh, that the node, that the, that, the, that the child node who has uh, generated the DAO packet has to in turn take care of the handling, but there are some issues with it. And the observation style, uh, draft has clarified it. This was discussed again in the previous uh, uh, session, so I won't go into the details there. I would like to present uh, uh, the solution. Next slide, please. So, uh, okay, forget the right hand side uh, uh, graph for, for for a moment. You know, just concentrate on the left hand side. Uh, so, what what we are suggesting is uh, the root the root node sends back a DAO act directly to the the, the node, uh, the target node, with the TI option, which has the path sequence. So, in this way. Uh, in this way, basically, the root node can inform the the, the target node what what what, what where, whether the end to end path has been established. There are several issues with this, uh, and I'll come to to those those points in, in the subsequent slides. So this is the, this is the fundamental proposition that in place of so, so we are not deprecating the existing DAO act mechanism at all. Uh, it is possible that the hop by hop existing hop by hop DAO mac mechanism is implemented at the same time this 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 mechanism is also implemented the only difference between a hop by hop DAO act and this DAO act is that the root node will send back the transit information option to the target node now, why transit information option has to be sent back to the uh, to the target node it's because the target node needs to know for which DAO is this DAO act sent for and every every target has is attributed by a path sequence, which is present in the transfer transmit information option. So, so this graph basically shows the different attributes which have to be passed. So one of the things that it that this mechanism also enables is that the border router can actually tell the target node as to what kind of route lifetime it should use. For example, the node decided to use, the target node decided to use the route lifetime of the 3600 seconds. Uh, the finally, the DAO reached uh, the border router. The router, the, the route might say that, okay, you can't use uh, 3600 uh, lifetime. You have to use 1800 seconds. Now, this is possible. This was not possible before. Uh, so there are some side effects, positive side effects implementing such a to doing such a kind of thing can i do, do you mind taking a question now or do you prefer take them at the yes, end yes yeah it's better to take it uh, while, while, while we are on that slide so yeah, let's go back to that slide okay um you know how so uh, i really love the idea i mean we discussed it uh, many times um yes it does not supersede the dao act so the call of the dao act is a bit different um Maybe it does not even need to be called the DAO hack. It's more. Okay. Uh, so present this uh, really in the case of the first, first DAO, and, and and you present it like uh, N twenty one sends a DAO, N eleven will send a DAO immediately, like this DAO. But the original intent was more like 
Uh, and it could aggregate uh, mostly in runtime, not on the first one, but in runtime. Uh, and 11 would periodically send uh, a big message with many uh, DAOs in it, many, many targets in it, uh, in a single message to uh, just give its current status and do that on its own period. Uh, the first DAO is a bit different, but the other ones are not like that. So I believe that what you really care is, is the first DAO. So that's really when the six, the, the root finds that it has reachability to a new node. And so this is not really the DAO work for the periodic DAO. The periodic DAO could be set by every node on the way, uh, aggregated on their own time. And since the path is already enabled, uh, the refresh doesn't have to be very precisely when the N21 sends the DAO. The re so this DAO work could wait a long time. It does not matter when you just refresh, as long as everything is done within that time. So absolutely. So, 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 so. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, sorry. You go ahead. Please continue. Please finish here. The, the way I see it is, it's it's more like a very specific mechanism for when we instantiate a new route. And N21 wants to know that it's reachable, but it does not really apply to the refresh of the DAO. Just the first one. Yes. Yes. Refresh. So so so. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. So uh, Pascal, that's that's that's. That's a very important point that you mentioned. So essentially, the first DAO needs to be taken care of with this DAO act, with, with, with the signaling. Uh, even to call it a DAO act, we also thought about it. You know, I was thinking about it whether I should be calling it a DAO act because it's 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 basically an asynchronous message which gets sent to the target. So that is the you're reachable. Three, yeah, you're reachable. So uh, it's it's we should not even be calling it DAO act. But for for the sake of this discussion. Let's call it DAO. I, I'm I'm open to changing this uh, this uh, term in, uh, you know this name. Uh, I think we should change it. Essentially, what it will allow us to do is this asynchronous message can take care of certain other problems as well in the future. Because this is the first time in storing MOP, we have a message from the root directly sent to the target mode. Target mode. Your second question, the refresh DAO. So basically, that is what uh, that is what I was coming to. So the the only change, the only change that is required in the transit information option is that the setting of this K flag, which says that uh, acknowledgement is sought, or some sort of response is sought. So, 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 you are reachable response is sought. Now, when an intermediate six LR sends a DAO, a refresh DAO. It won't set this K flag, or it should not set this K flag. It does not make sense for it to set this K flag. So uh, the refresh DAOs won't result in the same message getting sent back to the target node. Only the initial message uh, will get uh, we will result in uh, will result in this uh, message. I have one more uh, thing question. Like apart from the refresh, we have also parent switch case, right? Uh, yes, but uh, parent switch, we don't need to inform the target node that you are reachable because it is already reachable, right? Yeah. But uh, but if he switched because of some, uh, uh, like, uh, it is not able to reach to the previous parent and it is a, did the switch, then in that case also it needs the reachability information, right? So if it needs, if the target node thinks that it needs to know, then it can set the K flag. So what I'm trying to say is that the target node is in charge of setting this flag and letting itself know whether a complete end-to-end -end route path route has been set or not. So, if, if in this example, if N2 N2 one decided to switch to N22, it can set the K flag again or not set the K flag again. I mean, it's completely its call. But ideally, I would set the K flag because I want to know whether the end-to-end -end path is. Uh, but if N11 switches on behalf of N21 and sends N21 as the target, then it need not set the key flag for that that part yeah. i mean and the suit the suit the DAOs. Okay. i'm a bit concerned in piggybacking this information in dao because the dao is uh, maybe as you said the first dao is just copied as received uh, all the way up but normally the daos can be completely regenerated by the intermediate nodes yes uh, they don't yes. have to be stored and forwarded, meaning that should we store this K flag and then if we should we put
put it on every copy we send up until we get a DAO from below, which um, doesn't have, you know, we can at some point, there are cases where uh, by changing uh, the, uh, I don't remember the acronym, but this flag in the DIO, the parent can ask the child to give all the list of all the DAOs that it has. So basically empty uh, its, its routing table and uh, give all the routes that it has just to, to, to resync the, the, the parent. Um, so, so should should the K flag be be used in those cases? You know, um, is it something that that the internet nodes need to learn and remember when they reproduce the DAO? So, so, uh, so the K flag is very similar to the E flag in that aspect. So, an intermediate node has to also remember that the E flag is set on behalf of the target node. So, it's the same. Uh, yeah, it is one more flag, but uh, it, it's it, it has the same. Uh, same aspect or same characteristics as E flag in, in you know it has to e is a proper the E says that it's an external route right and yeah. th that's that's a, a physical thing it's not something that changes over time so it can really be stored by the intermediate node like N11 and if if the backbone router pulls N11 and says give me all the DAOs you have N11 can based on its tables rebuild uh, the DAO with an E and the E will be valid but should it store K and should it, uh, if it stores K's and, and you know, asynchronously BR asks and even give me all your DAOs and even sends the list of DAOs, if the K is, is, set, is, is set, then uh, all of a sudden the root will send a DAO hack to, to the N21 and N21 never asked that. No. Um, so, so it's not, it's, it's, a request. So, so it's not a physical property of N21. E is a physical property of N21 that doesn't change. Here it's more. And so, so, so I, I, I'm concerned a little bit. I know that somehow it cannot arrive to the root before the DAO arrives to the root, because how would the root send the packet back? Um, on the other hand, it's, it's hard to signal it in the DAO unless we say, hey, um, if you forward the DAO immediately, then you leave the K byte, the K bit. But if you store it in your database, in your uh, logical database, it's rib then you don't store the game flag or something. It's not something that you can reproduce asynchronously. So, so it's, it's kind of weird for me to, to use that. And I, 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 it's not like there is an easy answer of what's the best way. It's, well, I was thinking about exactly that when I asked you that, that point earlier. And, and my conclusion was uh, there should be a setting in the, in the root, basically, that says if this setting is there, each time you get a new route, like in what you shows up, um, then you send a packet to, to N21. But the problem is if N21 moves, oh, it moves, the root may not see anything new, and maybe N21 wants that information. So, so it's, it's kind of, you know, basically the way I see it is there could be a toggle, a, a setting in the root which says on the first appearance of N21, send asynchronously this message says, okay, I know you're here. And asynchronously when N21 moves, it may ask, am I reachable? Unicast to the root and the root will answer unicast, yes, you're reachable. But, I mean, first time proactive and then on demand. No. So on demand, yeah. The, the, the last thing I wanted to uh, say is a, is, is a, is a kind of a, a ripple ping. It's a ripple ping. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe that's what we actually really should be asking to have is yes. is that rather than um, try to do this here like this. I think for the reasons that you said, Pascal. Um, the problem with the ripple ping is the first ping, right? What triggers the first ping? Because you can't if if N twenty one sends a DAO and the ping, it may be that the ping passes goes faster than the DAO. Another root receives the first ping, but does not have a root. So what does it do? Um, so, so that's why, I mean, I guess it was piggybacked inside the DAO, kind of to say, hey. Um, I like the idea that the root, the root sends an acknowledgement to every time it gets new reachability information. So that's the asynchronous ping then. Yeah, that's, that's, the, that's the, oh, you're new, welcome to the, Welcome to the thing. And actually, that's kind of an opportunity actually even to do um, capabilities exchange. 
what are you able to do? Um, then afterwards, then maybe there's something in there in that thing that enables uh, dates later on where the root says, oh, and who who's your parent today? Um, and it's just, it's not a, it's a survey. It's not a, an exhaustive survey. It's just a regular survey. And we talked about this in capabilities that, you know, you might have to do that regular survey, I think, at one point. Yeah, so, so where we are is uh, you are establishing a uh, connex connection kind of between N21 and the, the root. The first time N21 shows up, the root tells, hey, based on the configuration that it has, it should basically tell N21, hey, I know you're here. And now when N21 moves, it can ping the root and, and check that the movement was uh, actually uh, Done. Okay, Raul, you have one minute more. Sorry, Kai, we should move on. Okay, but still, we have a problem that you know the yes. initial initial. Okay, initial. So, uh, okay, so this in the mini list, and you present okay, the document go. because yes, please, thank you. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, I mean, I will move out, move, 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 move faster. So there are a lot mm -hmm. of points to be considered in the target aggregation and all. So there, there are a lot of points, frankly speaking. Uh, all these are considered already. Uh, I will hope uh, we can get some reviews. And uh, uh, one of the primary points that Pascal mentioned, I'll take it, uh, Pascal and Michael mentioned, Michael also has uh, mentioned that point about using ping and pong like uh, mechanism. So one thing, we change the name of the message from DAWAC to something else. Next. Right. So I wanted to discuss about other things as well, but it looks like we don't have time. I wanted to understand how do we handle the observations out because still there, there, there is some other work that. Uh, so uh, will all the other points also, since, since we are not going to take it for, uh, we, we are not going to publish uh, Ripple observation. There are some other aspects also. A lot of aspects does not require the whole new draft, but it is still not an errata. So how to handle those things? Yeah, we plan probably to have a, another meeting at the end of May so we can raise all these issues and topics. Thank you very much, Raul. Uh, Georgios, hello. Are you there? Thank you. Please move uh, on. Uh, so this is the use cases for the certification draft. Uh, next slide, please. The objective here is to identify and group the use cases that prompt uh, DIS uh, modification. So we already have uh, several drops that discuss and request modifying the DIS control budget. So I have here the ripple observation, the uh, light DIS information, and the DIS modification. Uh, next slide, please. Please. Uh, is a uh, slide number three use case node joining DOTAC? That one? Oh, yes. That, yes. Thank you. Yes. Is there. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. I have the delay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yes. So, this first use case is about a node to join a DOTAC. So, typically, we have a, a smart meter that being replaced or a new uh, meter that is placed in the field while we have a ripple network that is running already and it is in a stable mode. According to the uh, RFC 6550, the meter will wait for the DIO, which might take long time if the trickle timers are in a relaxed mode because of the steady state of the, of the network. Alternatively, if the meter will send the DIS uh, packet, it will send in multicast because has no information about the Ripple network that is running. So in this case, uh, we will have the nodes that will receive this DIS in multicast to reset the electrical timers, and thus we will have a bunch of DIO packets back to back. And second thing is that this DIO responses will be in multicast, which in the end will uh, trigger to consume more energy in these nodes. Next slide, please. So 
in the IS modification drafts, a potential solution could be to add few uh, flags and options inside the DIS uh, control packet. So, for instance, with no inconsistency flag, the receiving nodes will not reset the electrical timers. With DIO type, these nodes will send back in unicast the DIO. With response spreading option, uh, the, the nodes that receive the DIS will not respond at the same time. And thus, we will avoid the collisions by sending at the same time the DIO packets. The DIS control packet, furthermore, may include metric container that will list uh, uh, routing constraints. And then the nodes that receive this DIS will respond only if they satisfy these constraints. So we have less nodes that will respond to the DIO. Uh, next slide, please. Done. Use case to define the func to attack. Uh, so the next uh, use case is the identifying defunct defunct dodac. Um, I will skip this slide. Next slide, please. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. So here we have a node that will continue to consider itself attached to a dodac, even if all its parents in the dodac are unreachable or have moved to another dodac. So in such dodac. Uh, can be characterized as being defunct from the node's perspective. And the problem is that if this node maintain the state about large number of defunct dodags, it may consume large portion of its memory. So next slide, please. So to tackle with this problem, again, a, DI a DIS message can be sent with flag such as inconsistency, no inconsistency, in order to not reset the trickle timers from the other nodes. It may include the solicited information option with I and D flags in order to identify the DODAC and a response spreading option in order to specify the suitable time interval over which the DIO responses may arrive. Next slide, please. Of delays. Use case and adjacency adjust problem. I do not see this slide. Yeah, okay. So, no. so the next slide comes from the draft of Raoul of uh, Ripple Observation, so the adjacency probing. Now, in order to reduce the control traffic overhead, Ripple comes with the trickle timer algorithm to update the configuration parameters. But the problem is that when we do not have actual traffic, the regular traffic, or layer two traffic uh, at, so for instance, the enhanced beacons, the adjacencies cannot be tested and therefore cannot be repaired if they're broken. Now, 6550 comes with mechanism in the in form of Unicas DIS to trigger a DIO from the other nodes. And the nodes that receive uh, this Unicas DIS will respond with the Unicas DIO including configuration options. Now, the discussion part of this uh, use case is whether this mechanism could as well be made use of for probing adjacencies. Next slide, please. So the question comes, and uh, it's the following. Should the probing scheme be standardized? And there are a few recommendations. That the frequency of probing dependent on the traffic conditions. But in some cases, uh, DIO uh, probing uh, the, the, the neighbors by setting the, uh, the, uh, the DIS in multicast can be advantageous. And probing can happen in both directions, meaning parent to, the ch to child and child to parent. So these are things that we may discuss. Next slide, please. So hereafter, I will have a few slides to show you some preliminary results that we have by implementing DIS notification and to see the benefits. So we, we are working on this with uh, Aris and our new intern, Dimitris, Dimitrios. So we work with Kuja and Kontikinji. We have a network, small network of 10 nodes in grid topology with a ripple and 60s minimum at the layer two. Next slide, please.
So here we have the default version of 6550 where there are no flags and no options. And as you can see, in the node 6 is the one that is willing to join the network that is already running. On, uh, and the background of the node 6 in gray color, it means that it has no uh, radio, so its radio is off. And in red color means that it has no parent. So, and when it turns on green color, it means that it got a parent. So, around at 30 minutes, the node 6 turns on its radio and sends a DIS multicast uh, control packet. And according to 6550, the, what you see here, it will happen. Basically, it means that all neighborhood nodes will respond uh, with the I.O. back to back in broadcast. And they will reset the electrical timer. And that's why you see this burst of the I.O.s one next to each other. Now, if you go to the next slide, and by including, and I will go quickly here, by having, for instance, the end flag only option, the nodes that will receive this DIS, this multicast DIS control packet, they will not reset the vertical timer, so they will send only one. Here, as you can see, we have two or three sometimes DIOs back to back. This is because the problem comes from the 60s minimal. We, we do have collisions when they try to send back, and that's why they try to resend this DIO control packet. And if you go to the next slide, please. Thank you. We solve the problem by including end flag and response spreading between zero and two seconds. And as you can see in the bottom figure, we avoid the problem of the collisions and we do have only one uh, DIO transmission uh, in response from the nodes. So if you go to the next slide, please, I will skip the next one. Please. And T flex MC. Next one, please, so that I will have more okay. time. And T flex MC RS. So much. So this is the final with having the two flags and the two options. Basically, we have N flag for not reset, resetting the trickle timer. We have the T flag in order the devices will transmit back in unicast. So this is the green color that you see in X. We do have the metric container that includes uh, constraints. Basically, it says, uh, for instance, if the rank of the node that receives this DIS is higher than the X and Y value, if it satisfies, then yes, you can send back your DIO. And RS option in order to give some uh, spreading so that we do not receive these responses at the same time, so we do not have a collision. So as you can see in the bottom, figure, the, we have only four green responses. So basically, we reduce by half the nodes that will respond. They do respond in unicast, because we have only the green colors. And they do not send at the same time, so we do have, we do avoid the collisions. Next slide, please. Forward. Yeah. Thank you. And this is my last slide. Here, I'd like to initiate the discussion. If you have more use cases that we are missing here, please let us know so we will include them. The next question that I would like to discuss is whether you think this draft should be in the appendix of a solution draft or not. Mm -hmm. Third question that I'd like to discuss or initiate is whether, as a working group, we are going for a single or multiple solutions. So far, we have lighting DIO and DIS modification. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Georges, for making it fast. Uh, questions? I think it would be nice to have uh, comments about these use cases, since that user for this modification draft. Um, questions? No? See how eliding DIO and this modifications are, you know, I mean, eliding DIO and this work sort of overlaps with each, with each other. I, I see, I see there's no, I mean, there's, there's hardly any overlap between these two. I mean, eliding DIO is a different proposition altogether. Actually, Brown, uh, this is Dominic speaking. Uh, eliding DIO has a 
yeah. request for DNS modification as well. Okay, okay, okay. All right, okay. So that happened, right? Yeah, okay. So we, we do want to design a common solution, not a fight. Okay, thank you very much, Arjun. Okay. Uh, yeah. Dio, so, Dio. Yeah. Yeah, so please, again, uh, if anybody in the working group has uh, another reason why a DAS should behave differently than it does in uh, 6550, then please let us know. Uh, so we can design a, a solution that works for everybody. We really need it, need that. And Dimitris is uh, uh, with us to to run simulations. Make sure we do it right. So now is the time. Thank you very much. Can I? Yeah. Um, we 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 had this a number of discussions for the this modification, and you know I, I'm a big supporter of this work. I think the use case is important, uh, and, and one use case that really hurts us in the past in the field is the use case where you have a, a power down. You know, we have smart grid applications of repo, so we have this this area which is power down, like the, the, the power is cut, and then all of a sudden there is a power restore, and so all the meters, all the repo devices, they they kind of power on at the very same time. And that, that's an interesting use case because if we just do the DS in a fashion that the devices don't know that the other devices are suffering from the same thing, then they, they might actually be sending a lot of traffic, uh, this traffic, which would possibly even prevent the reception of the IOs. And in that case, that's exactly the opposite you want. You want do this and you want the IOs. And all the space must be used by the IOs to form the new network. And everybody crying out, hey, I lost my parent, I'm here, I'm looking for a parent. It's a very bad idea. So it's a use case where you want to determine that uh, you, you don't understand this. You, so we have to be very careful of Basically, last time we discussed that, Dominique, we concluded that it could be good to have a button, something on the meter, to trigger a disk like the ones you are describing here. Um, because the, the guy who installs the new meter, he knows that it's just an asynchronous device, not a bunch of devices that could be rebooted at the same time. So th what we want is very different in those two use cases. Right. We want to change them from just one, one device booting. The very good point, Pascal. We'll make sure to capture that in in the document. And yes, at hardware level, the the device can tell the difference between power up and and button press or something. So it well, differently. It's very hard on booting. The, the only thing you could do is do something like trickle. So when you boot, you refrain from sending the DS. You listen, and if you hear a lot of this, then you refrain from sending a DS. So you kind of trickle out the DS just like you trickle out the DIOs. Right, but on provisioning, uh, you're not booting. Um... If you're booting, so normally the, the behavior would be I boot and I send this DS. Uh, asking from Unicast and saying uh, this is not a, a discrepancy or whatever, uh, but, but inconsistency, inconsistent. okay. I was okay. But, but in that, if, yeah, if you about, then you can actually listen that other people are doing the same thing and then you don't. Okay. We'll, uh, we're running short of time, but uh, we'll definitely take that into account. Thank you. Just keep it in mind when we design. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Michael, are you there? Thank good. you. Please. I'm here. Can good. All right. Um, so I, I, when I made the slide, I realized the title of the of the document maybe is a little bit wordy, and I'm welcome changes to that. Next slide, please. Uh, so we split this document off from Six Dish Enhanced Beacon in 2016, um, and it had the name Join in the title, which was confusing because people thought it was about Dodag joining. Uh, and so as much consistently as possible, um, it now says enroll or enrollment rather than join. Uh, it says version 02, but I meant over three. And I've removed all the remaining references to the word join, except for join proxy um, uh, from the document. To be clear, this is not about joining or finding a parent. Next slide. 
did that. Um, added a section of what to do with the options not present. Next slide. Uh, so I'll just run through these. Uh, Pascal, I, I used your diagram. Uh, so here's a bunch of exam uh, a dodag, 51, 52, 53, and 25 are nodes that are trying to join. They have a little duck on them. Next slide. Um, so what we assume is that this new priority would come out, and I'm just going to say it comes out with a, a hexadecimal 10. Next slide. And it spreads, and each node at each layer as it sees that in its DIO, adds some value to it depending on its local congestion when it announces. Next slide. Um, so in this case, node 13 is gonna is sending an enhanced beacon. Well, probably all of them are enhanced sending beacons, but this one's the only one we care about. And let's say it contains, the enhanced beacon contains the value 22, which is what it would have uh, broadcast had it been, uh, or 23 would it broadcast had it uh, been there. Next slide. Um, so in the case of a deeper one, it continues down. Next slide. Uh, the color gets darker as the number gets higher. And um, what happens is at the end, we get a number, in this case, 72. 51 sees this value, 72. Next slide. Um, and it goes another track. Next slide. Um, so in this case, 32 is discovered that he's full. He has no maybe. He has no more neighbor entries or his uh, um, storing node and the, the uh, routing tables full. Exact reasons are not important or specified, but the important thing is that he sends, he's full, so he sends us a 127, 7F value down to 42. Next slide. And so 42 still sends his enhanced beacon, but he sends it with a 7F, which tells 51 and 52 that this is really a bad place to join or enroll. Next slide. Um, so it comes down 33, lower value. Next slide. Next slide. And 43 announces this much better value of 52. And so uh, coincidentally, node 52 is going to enroll to his right to uh, node 43 rather than to his left to node 42. Next slide. Um, what did I change? Oh, with an impaired node. Okay, so in this case, uh, we're going to have an impaired node, which is node number um, uh, 24. Okay, so that's the one two layers down. Um, so it receives the 23, but it doesn't know what to do with it. So it deletes it. Next slide. Um, does not support this option. Next slide. And so number 35, when it receives the DIO and it doesn't see this value, it assumes the value of, of, of 40, of uh, so uh, four zero, so that's a sixty four, so that's the halfway value between zero and one twenty eight, one twenty seven, um, and this number is certainly open to discussion. Um, next slide. So it adds some v value to this uh, based on its own local condition. It announces that next slide. Forty six happens to announce another value fifty one, um, and so. Uh, that means there's still a value that still has something to say, um, but it may be inaccurate. There may be no real connection between uh, 35 and the conditions at 24. 24 can be completely full. We don't know. Next slide. Um, and obviously there's other announcements there of a, another value. Um, next slide. That's really it. Um, as I said, I added the section on what to do uh, if there's no value. Um, and there's some discussion about what would happen if the option wasn't present. And if the option wasn't present, then we would still have the problem at 24 that it was congested and no one knew. Uh, but at least we have a little bit more management in the subdo dag of what's happening. And uh, as I said, maybe there's some other better default value we can pick. Thank you very much, Michael. Questions? No, we would like to have review of this document, please. Um, Pardon me? We would like to have a review, review like people read it, review, so we can move forward with the last call. Thank you. Um, the last presentation, Pascal, you have 10 minutes. Okay, so this is, uh, for some of you, it's a new work. For some of you, it's uh, more uh, another work. So this is a, a draft that we kind of decided collectively to do 
during one of the role intermeetings, meetings what we saw is that um, there, there is more configuration information that is being exchanged uh, within the Ripple protocol. And that's very important to us because we care about what we call autonomic properties, meaning that the, the device can boot with uh, almost zero configuration and they will learn from the protocol how to operate the protocol. So it's like you don't have CLI in the IoT devices, all the quote unquote CLI has to come from, from the root. But then the more and more information we place there, uh, the biggest, as we just said uh, earlier, the DIOs will become to the point that uh, it's unbearable if you have to provide this information all the time. We already foresaw that with the Ripple configuration option. And um, so we said, hey, you don't have to place the Ripple configuration option in every DIO. But guess what? If you don't, um, then some nodes will boot and get DIOs, but they won't have the configuration. And they don't even know that they're missing it. Or it could happen that um, the DIO is sent with the configuration option with a change in it, and some node did not hear that DIO and still operates on the old configuration, and there is no way to know that this node is uh, desynchronized, quote-unquote, in terms of configuration uh, versus the other nodes. So we, we discussed that and together at this interim, and we decided to, to have some form of synchronization information, like database synchronization, if you like, a bit like um, when you synchronize LSDBs in the early state, just, just to, 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 to not configure, synchronize the routes, but synchronize the configuration, make sure that every node has the latest information about configuration. And as we go, we realize that it's not just the Ripple configuration, there are actually five options that are concerned with this problem. So the idea is, let's put something in DIO so that nodes can know whether they have the latest or not. And if they don't have the latest, let's do something with the this, and that's what Dominique was telling us a few minutes ago, the this is actually used in this document to be able to pull a new version of the configuration or uh, the other options that we cover. Can we go down? So I have not been working on this draft. I mean, we did not discuss it much on the mailing list either since IETF 106. And uh, the reason is, you know, the Ripple and Aware uh, and the turn on 8138 were already a lot of work. Um, I mean, with the chairs, we, we work also, and, and Michael, we worked on the, the use of Ripple Info. So all this was a lot of work just for this group. So we can't, you know, move every every cart at the same speed. So so this one was kind of uh, in back burner, but it's 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 probably cool to 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 look at it again uh, quite quite soon now. It's also something that we have to probably probably integrate as part of this a bunch of RFCs that we want to see as core for Ripple V2. So I'm asking, is it a, a good time now to start uh, working on this again? And the same question would apply to NPDAO probably. And so uh, I don't think I've republished since uh, the split of MOPEX and capabilities. I, I, I know I, I, I was on it to do some edits, but uh, I, I don't remember if I republished. Next, please. So basically the goal is not to have to place every option and we'll see that there's a slide on the list of options in every possible DIOs. Also enable to place options in not just one DIOs but a sequence of DIOs. And to be able to ensure that then we need to, to, to do something so that all the DIOs which represent the same bunch of information look like a single DIO that's split in multiple messages. So, so that's also part of what we want to achieve here. And to do that, we have added uh, a sequ DIO sequence counter, basically. But it's not per option, it's, it's basically the sequence of the DIO. If you sequence the DIO, then you can do two things. The first thing is, uh, if I need to split this thing in three DIO messages, then they will have the same sequence. And the, the second thing is, uh, if I want to refer to when the configuration option was changed for the last time, for instance, I can say, hey, it was changed with configuration state, state sequence block. So if this node has uh, the DIO configuration option, uh, the Ripple configuration option associated to an earlier uh, state sequence, then it knows that it needs to pull the most recent configuration from the bar. That, that's the core of what we want to do. Next, please. 
please. So, so we have added this, this new state sequence, and we have a new abbreviated option. Option. So it's a, you have two O's, and there is a reason. It's an option, and it, it tells you that it's abbreviating another option. So basically, this is a very small vector which says which option it's abbreviating. And basically, the only thing it does is give you the last RCSS, the last sequence, when this particular option was updated. So instead of putting the full option, if it was not changed since the previous RCSS, you can just say, uh, here is this AOO, which is a replacement. If it matches what the, the node that received the DIO knows as the most recent state for this option, then the node knows that it's up to date. If it doesn't match, then the node needs, the node needs to pull. I've also, I, I needed to, to change the base objects as we want to do that. Um, so I had to change the DIO to, to put its own sequence. Um, there was also this discussion uh, with Raul in part uh, for the DAO messages, right? We keep sending DAO over and over with the full information. Same thing, a DAO could be abbreviated if you, are, if you send the, the, the exact same a list of, of hosts as before, then, then uh, you could abbreviate them. So there's also an abbreviated version of DAO. And since now we turn the this into a query message, please give me the latest option blah, then th there needed to be also something changed in the this base object, basically flags indicating which uh, option is being queried. Next. So as, as I said, there are actually uh, five uh, options which are considered in, in this in this draft and there's the global capability the map mopex uh, the pio the dot dot configuration so report configuration option and the the route information option which which is basically how you know particular more, more specific routes this particular route can reach so if you have to select the DAC based on where it can actually reach on the outside and that's the route information option. So all of them are information that are useful to the node, that are that should quote unquote be repeated on every DIO. But you know the prefix of uh, all the external routes uh, which, uh, can be reached through the route. They don't tend to change a lot. So once the network has settled, there is really no point to to expose them. But unless there is a new node or something, a node that does not know them. So we enable to, to, to say, hey, they exist. Here is the last sequence for them. And if a particular node is missing them, then it can go and ask through the disk. Next. And there is this uh, AOO option. As I said, what it mostly says is, oh, I'm a replacement for option blah. So option blah being this, uh, the third, that's three here, a brave option. So it's just one of those five options we, just, we just show. And um, the, the the byte after that is the sequence number uh, when it was last changed. Next. One minute, Pascal. Sorry. And pretty much there. So this is the change in the this to uh, request the particular option. So you get the, the four option plus uh, I don't remember what that is, but basically that's what it says. It tells basically to the the child tells the parent, hey, I want those options, uh, and for those options here is the last thing I know about them. There are more details, so if I have just one minute, uh, I can go through that, but that's a summary of how the uh, RCSS operation works. Prevented by the root, uh, lollipop, or all the usual. And also, it, it can be an information, it's not completely definite information, but it can be an information that helps the node to know that the root is rooted, by the way. That was another question by how. There is the other slide that explains you what's happening. So if a child uh, wants to resynchronize, then it can use those five bits and indicate, you know, what it knows and uh, what the latest it knows. And then the parent can see, oh, this has changed. Let me give it to him. This has not changed. Let me give him the abbreviated option. And that's it. That was Thank you very point. much. Thank you very much, Pascal. Um, um, questions? To the group. I mean, uh, are people interested in I did that work based on a request by the group. So do I do I get support to, to move on? Uh, are you willing to discuss it on the list uh, now, later? Uh, sure. Uh, 
George here, Georgios? Yes. The same question that I had before, actually, whether do you think it will be like two different solutions or do you think it will be wise to include the DIS modifications inside this and go with one solution? So actually, the, the reason why Dominique is on this is that the original point was to merge. Uh, that's why we were for, bit, for five bits. For I, I'm not sure. Well, the, the original idea was to merge. I, I have no no clue if it's better or not. They need to be consistent. That's for sure. So at least shipping them together at the same time and keeping them, you know, well well synchronized, that's important. Right. Exactly. We could have uh, one that focuses on. Uh, eliding DIO and sequence numbers and stuff, and have one focus on the new DIS uh, semantic and format, but at least we want them to be consistent. Or we could do just one big draft, but it's usually a bit more difficult to handle. I have no strong opinion on this, as long as they work together. As long as we are not trying to put a fragmentation and a compression on the same document, I guess. We... <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> okay. any, any strong opinion on that by anybody in the group? Recommendations? Maybe Alvaro? I think that we are right to kind of let this work um, coast for a bit. I think we, I think that we need to probably, probably, um, I think we need to probably let some of this stuff uh, coast a little bit further until we get the, do the rest of the documents pushed on a bit. Um, and the reason is not so much just because we need to get it. Um, uh, we have only so much, so many cycles, but I think that we need to get some experience from the stuff that we've done. All of the role and the use of RPL and the other and the capabilities stuff i think we need to get some cycle of feedback from implementers to 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 continue before we can step onto this part um for that and as i wrote in the chat uh earlier half hour ago um i think we're getting very close to uh uh 6550 this um thinking um and and i think that that this kind of thing actually may be what pushes us in over the over the hill into saying, okay, this is really a new, actually just a new mop, and we need to do this right that way. Okay. Okay. Thank you. But definitely, we want to take this use case into consideration for these modifications. I think we have the need uh, clearly expressed. Not hear what you say, Dominic. Sorry, can you repeat? Yeah, I was just saying. At least uh, we have the need for a modification in India. It's clear, clearly identified. Uh, the way the solution is engineered for eliding DIO uh, is probably maybe not fully cast in in iron, but at least we uh, we know we want to do something with DIS to address that need. So we can, on, on our side, we can start working on, on DIS modifications, taking that use case into account. Thank you. Mm, so one question, do you want to, ha to oh, do you want to have another meeting at the end of May, like two hours meeting to yes, keep working? Definitely. Okay, yes. yeah, so we will organize. Thank you very much. So next uh, steps is uh, we are going to send a summary of this meeting with the action, action points and the link with the recording. So, and if someone has further questions, we are here. <laughs> so I think we can conclude the meeting. We are four minutes above the limits. So, but um, uh, thank you very much for today. Um, for the conversation, uh, we keep in the mailing list until the next meeting. It's okay for you two hours, right? Or 2.5. I think two hours is fine. So we don't.
Okay, yeah. so if two, we can still have another interim meeting if you want to. Okay, so now I will stop the recording. Better to have uh, a couple of meetings of less time more frequently than yeah, yeah, the agree. ones that are harder to survive. Right. Agree. Okay, stopping the recording. Thank you for so much.